I'm delighted to welcome our second speaker, Dr. Richard McGilligot. And from reading through uh, Richard's CV, I seriously question whether he has more hours in the day than the rest of us, um, judging by his list of uh, accomplishments and outputs. Um, Richard holds a PhD in Modern Irish History from UCD. And in, sept in September of last year, he took up his position in, as a lecturer in Irish history in the Department of Humanities at Dundalk Institute of Technology. He's a proud Kerry man, and so much so that he wrote a book about it, Forging a Kingdom, the Gaelic Athletic Association in Kerry, 1884 to 1934, was published by Collins Press in 2013. And it was the first in-depth examination of the GAA's development in a single county, set in the social, political and economic context of a transformative period in Irish history. Richard is currently working on a project that examines the impact and the legacy of the Irish Civil War on everyday life and society in the Irish Free State from 1924 to 1939. And now he will discuss the interplay between politics and the GAA and how the GAA and Kerry played a key role in healing the bitterness of the Civil War. So welcome, Richard. Thanks, Siobhan, and good morning, everyone. And thanks also to Julianne and everyone here in the Crow Park Museum, basically for asking me here today to contribute to the wonderful initiative uh, the G is starting here today to mark the centenary of Bloody Sunday, and I suppose more broadly, the role of the association and its members during the turbulent years of the Irish War of Independence. I suppose what I'm doing with this talk is kind of fast-forwarding through that conflict to look at the immediate legacy of the War of Independence, the Anglo-Irish Treaty, and of course, how it spawned the bitter and indeed brutal Irish Civil War. Now, as, as Siobhan said, I'm from Kerry, that'll become blindingly obvious, and uh, I'll never forgive Dermot over there for 2002, <laughs> my first ever All-Ireland seeing Kerry lose. But anyway, uh, we've lost plenty since, unfortunately. <laughs> but anyway, um, now, being from Kerry, I suppose we're blessed to have been home of so many great teams and players. You know, I came, up, I came to adulthood watching legends like Morris Fitzgerald, Seamus Moynihan, that man over there, Colin Cooper, bring Sam Maguire back to Kerry uh, summer after summer, about it, uh, in the decade before this. Uh, for many, I suppose, the very mention of Kerry GA, I suppose it brings forth images of Mikko's Marvels, icons like Pawdy, Ogie, Jacka, Jacko, and them dancing across, uh, you know, a truly golden age, an era of, of success. But I suppose recentism is the curse of the historian. And that, I suppose, understandable human impulse to see the latest as always being the greatest and the most special and important and so on. But today I want to discuss the history of another Kerry team, a team that in my humble opinion was the greatest and most remarkable my county ever produced. Now, there's no golden years videotape of them, no YouTube highlights reel, but if you delve into the archives, uh, you will see that their status and fame was unsurpassed. And until the GA centenary year in 1984, they remained the most successful team in the association's long history, and they had dominated it like none before them. Now, that team emerged from the still smouldering embers of the Civil War, a conflict which in Kerry left a more bitter divide and a more poisonous legacy than I would argue anywhere else. Now, what's most remarkable about them is that they were a team made up of the opposing sides of the treaty's ideological divide. Men who were prominent in the war, its terms had unleashed across Ireland. Now, out of the ashes of that civil war, this team arose, which, for many, their on-field success was seen as atonement for what Kerry itself had suffered during that conflict. And they really did become this, an exalted, they were exalted as this beacon of hope and reconciliation in a country where the wounds of war still wept. Now, of course, as a historian, I appreciate the reality is much more complex and because of that, far more interesting. Because this Kerry team and their unique story illuminates the often neglected national history of the Civil War's bitter and traumatic legacy. But I guess to understand that legacy, I first want to try briefly to contextualize Kerry's experience of the Civil War. Now, in the cold, dark, pre-dawn hours of the 7th of March, 1923, nine IRA prisoners, including three men from my own village of Kilflynn in North Kerry, were taken from their cells in Tralee Barracks for the very last time. Now, for several days previously, they had been interrogated by their captors in the Free State Army. Now, this interrogation amounted to being blindfolded and having their arms tied to their sides while their heads, 
bodies and limbs were liberally smashed with hammers. They were thrown back into their cells, so spattered in their own blood that their shirts were clinging to their backs. The men were also put through the terrifying ordeal of a mock execution by a firing squad, all of course in an effort to make them talk. Now, on this particular March morning, the prisoners were placed in a lorry under heavy escort and driven out to Ballycedy Cross outside Tralee, unaware that they would become victims of what, in my opinion, was one of the greatest atrocities of the entire Irish revolutionary period. Initially told they were being taken to remove a stone barricade erected by the IRA, once they alighted, they were ordered towards the barricade where the prisoners' arms, knees and legs were bound together with rope and then they were each tied to each other. They were placed sitting around the stones with their backs to a landmine the soldiers had already placed at the centre of the rubble. Now, by some miracle, this man here, Stephen Fuller, who was from Kilflynn, would survive the horror of what followed. And at the age of 80, a couple of years before he died, he, Fuller finally agreed to a request to be filmed about Bally Seedy uh, for Robert Key's 1980 documentary series, Ireland, A Television History. And it was the only time in his whole life that he ever publicly spoke of what happened that day. Uh, as Fuller recalled, and I'm going to quote him here exactly what he said, they said they were going to blow us up with a mine. None of us said anything. Uh, the language they used was abusive language. It wasn't very good. One fellow called us Irish bastards, and he was an Irishman himself. One of our, last, our lads asked to be let say his prayers, and the fellow who was tying him hit him on the head and said, no prayers. Our fellows didn't get any time for prayers. The soldiers moved away, but an officer stayed behind and took off our caps and said, you can be praying away now as long as you like. The next fellow to me said his prayers, and I said mine too. He said goodbye, then I said goodbye, and the next lad picked it up and said, goodbye, lads, goodbye. Then up it went, and I went up with it, of course. Now, by a freak, I said, uh, Fuller was actually blown clear of the explosion that really tore the bodies of his comrades apart, and he eventually managed to crawl to safety under darkness. But as he was doing so, he heard the low moans and cries of those still clinging to life and how they were quickly ended as the soldiers moved in uh, and opened fire and hurled in grenades. Now, it wasn't yet dawn, and I suppose given the scene of carnage, the soldiers had no way of telling that Fuller had actually escaped, that they were actually missing a body. Instead, they shoveled the remains of the pulverized bodies into nine separate coffins and drove them back to Tralee. And locals recalled how, and I quote, the birds were eating the flesh off the trees around Ballycedy for days afterwards. Now, in an effort to avoid any unnecessary complications, the Free State Commander in Kerry, General Paddy Daly, allegedly ordered that the men selected were to be, and I quote, all fairly anonymous. No priests or nuns in the family, those that will make the least noise. And I think that's a graphic illustration of the premeditated and calculated nature of what had just transpired. But for the victims' families, the ordeal was only beginning. Uh, nine coffins were seen being in unloaded at Trilly Barracks, and quickly rumours swept the town about the mutilated flesh visible around Ballyseedy. Now, Bill Bailey, a Trilly native, served as a private in the Free State Barracks, and he recalled that around 4 p.m. that afternoon, around 400 people, including the relatives of the prisoners, converged on the barrack entrance, demanding that their bodies be handed over. Now, as the soldiers prepared to pass the crude plank coffins through the gate, the army's brass band assembled right behind them, and they began playing this, an uptown ragtime jazz number called the Sheik of Araby. Of Arabi, your love belongs to me. But I just want to let that sink in. I suppose the callousness of, of that act. And Bailey described the crowd initially being left, as he said, completely shocked and dazed by what was happening, and then suddenly becoming, as he called it, demented with rage. Uh, the relatives tried to tear open the coffins, trying to identify the remains, while the rest of the mob uh, basically cursed and stoned the soldiers present. Now, an army communique was released claiming that the nine prisoners were accidentally killed clearing a mine road, a mined road. Yet, of course, because of Fuller's uh, survival, that lie was quickly exposed. And despite this, the official inquest exonerated the Free State Army of any impropriety. Now, that was an unsurprising verdict given General Daly himself presided over those proceedings. But um, Ballycedy was actually an official reprisal for the events of the two previous days. 
On the 5th of March, six Free State soldiers were killed attacking an IRA flying column in the Granatan Mountains. The next day, the IRA in Nakhnagashal tricked a Free State Army patrol into converging on a disused dugout. Now, their intention was to kill Patrick O'Connor, a local man who had joined the Free State Army after his family farm had been raided and destroyed by the IRA. Now, of course, a special animosity was harbored towards O'Connor, as because of his local knowledge, several Republicans in the area had been captured, and he was also said to have taken an eager part in their interrogations. So O'Connor led a five-man detachment to the dugout, which was booby-trapped with a trigger mine. And of course, when it was tripped, O'Connor was decapitated and four others instantly killed, two of whom were close personal friends of General Paddy Daly. But in itself, Bally City was not considered a sufficient reprisal for these events. The same morning, five IRA prisoners were taken to Countess Bridge in Killarney to clear another stone barricade. Again, the Free State soldiers had concealed a mine inside the debris, which was detonated. However, the mine failed to kill all the prisoners outright, and in the confusion, Ty Coffey was able to escape while the soldiers finished off his comrades. Then, on the 12th of March, a third cohort of five IRA prisoners was murdered by another mine explosion outside the town of Car Savine. And of course, to try and avoid any repeat of Coffey's getaway in Killarney, the men were first shot in the legs and then laid across the mine to ensure there was no possibility of their survival. And so, in the three weeks that followed the deaths of 11 Free State soldiers, 22 IRA prisoners were killed in Free State custody, the majority in the horrific, like, in the horrific instance like I've just described. And in total, over 200 IRA members and 150 Free State soldiers died in the Civil War in Kerry. And the bitterness of that conflict in Kerry, I suppose, stemmed from the inability of the Free State Army to crush the IRA's resistance in this, their last stronghold, at a time, of course, when Free State forces were poised to sweep to total victory in the rest of Ireland. And I guess the callous and brutal cycle of the killings, reprisals, and atrocities that defined the war in Kerry in that spring of 1923 reflected both the frustrations of the Free State forces and not being able to seal victory, and the desperation of the IRA there to continue the struggle by any means possible. Now, really, across Kerry, communities would be shattered by the orgy of violence that was let loose. Bally Seedy, as I said, claimed the lives of two young men from my village, while Stephen Fuller remained haunted by its memory. And little over a month later, uh, another young Kilflin man, the popular IRA guerrilla leader, Tim Aero Lyons, died in the siege of Clash Melkin Caves on the Atlantic coast of North Kerry. Uh, Lyons had actually negotiated his surrender and had grabbed hold of a rope lowered by Free State Free State forces to pull him and his comrades up uh, the cliff from the caves. However, as he neared the cliff top, the rope was severed and Lyons plunged to his death. The remaining four men were taken to Tralee Barracks and executed just five days before the ceasefire that ended the Civil War. Now, Paddy Daly would always remain unapologetic about how his forces conducted their campaign. After the ceasefire, he declared, and I quote, nobody asked me to take my kid gloves to Kerry and I didn't take them. Now, really, the Irish Civil War was a vicious and a very squalid struggle, one in which all sides committed acts that often left the actions of British, the British during the War of Independence in the shade. And, of course, the official end of the military activity in May 1923 did not end the bitterness, the resentment, the anger, and sense of loss felt by communities all across Ireland. And for decades after, in areas like Kerry, the legacy of the Civil War was, remained potent, poignant, and indeed poisonous. So that is a little bit of context of the emergence of this Kerry team I'm going to talk about. A team, as I said, comprised of men across the bitter political divide. A team that would go on to dominate like none before them. And it was a team that set a new standard for Gaelic football and became, for a divided and weary county, and indeed country, this great symbol of the power of sport to unify and to inspire. Uh, but all of this happened pretty inauspiciously. Uh, as the GA got back on its feet in the summer of 1923 and resumed activity after so much disruption, the draws for that year's Munster Championship were made, and uh, Kerry were actually paired against Limerick. However, due to the in intimate relationship between the Kerry GA and the local Republican movement, many of Kerry's leading players were among the hundreds of Kerry men now interned by the Free State or else on the run following the end of the Civil War. 
Uh, as a result, when the first training session for the Limerick game was organized in Tralee, only two Kerry players could actually turn up. So in desperation, the county board scoured the country and eventually it found a full team. It was able to cobble together a full team uh, that not only defeated Limerick, but against all the odds, it has to be said, went on to beat a strongly fancied Tipperary team, All-Ireland champions just a year before in the Munster final played that October. Now, two months after that game, the Free State Government began the slow release of 11,000 IRA internees being held in the aftermath of the Civil War. Now, during their captivity, uh, Gaelic football contests became a regular means of keeping up fitness and discipline and morale among the IRA prisoners. And of course, word had quickly got out of the dominance of Kerry players in these competitions in the internment camps. And once they were released, the Kerry Man newspaper reported that the Kerry internees were anxious to represent their county in the upcoming All-Ireland semi-final. The paper noted that they were confident, and I quote, that they had a 15 more than capable of beating the current Kerry side. And so, on the 10th of February, 1924, a challenge match between the pick of the Kerry ex-internees and the Munster champions was duly arranged. Now, given the way they were politically and ideologically opposed to many players in the current Kerry side, such as Kerry captain, the Kerry captain, Con Brosnan, who was a serving Free State Army officer, it's not surprising both sides saw this very much as a grudge match. And the fact that Kerry selectors had decided to use it as a trial for the upcoming semi-final only heightened this match's importance. As a sporting event then, the game took on a huge political undercurrent. It came... Therefore, it's no surprise that the Kerryman found the game to be, in its report, and I quote, robust at times too much so, marred by a large number of fouls, ensuring the referee was kept busy. And you have to admire the delicious uh, euphemism of that short report. Uh, the match was indeed a very tight affair, with little to separate the sides, but the Munster champions came out on top narrowly. Now, the pride very much dented, the internees requested a replay, uh, which saw them claim a comfortable victory, and the Kerry selectors certainly took note. Therefore, on the 27th of April, 1924, a much-changed Kerry team travelled to Dublin to take on Cavan. It now included nine of the ex-internees, including their teak tough full-back, Joe Barrett, and Kerry star forward, John Joe Sheehy, who was actually still on the run and wanted by the authorities at that stage over his IRA activity. Now, it was the first time since the War of Independence had enveloped Ireland in 1919 that Kerry had actually played in Croke Park. And as torrential rain started to fall on the ground, this new Look Kerry team prepared to enter the pitch. And the Cork Examiner reported what happened next. And it said, and I quote, A youthful brigade in their early 20s stalked upon the field. On entering, the Kerry team proceeded to the spot where Mick Hogan, the Tipperary player, was shot on Bloody Sunday. They knelt in silent prayer on the fateful sod, while the spectators maintained a respectful silence. The action on Kerry's part was warmly appreciated by the crowd. As the Kerry team walked to the centre, the cheering was long and loud. Now, to the watching press and the thousands looking on, I suppose the symbolism of that moment, that simple gesture of respect to the memory of a murdered Gale was profound. It was felt that as a team, this Kerry side had knelt divided, but they now arose united, their unity forged by that mutual respect for the Kerry jersey and all that it represented. And in his excellent book on the history of this era uh, and the Kerry GA during it, uh, in the name of the game by J.J. Barrett, who was actually son of Joe Barrett on that team. Uh, Barrett wrote that with that poignant act, as he said, the healing process had begun in Kerry. But I suppose this team's sense of unity was immediately tested. Following victory, Kerry were uh, set to play the All-Ireland Champions Dublin in the final. However, with 2,000 IRA prisoners still being held, including the Kerry GA chairman, Austin Stack, local Republicans called on the team to boycott the final until the prisoners were released. And this call was wholeheartedly supported by the IRA under its new chief of staff, Moss Toomey. Now, on the 10th of June, a meeting of the Kerry team endorsed the boycott. Though it placed players like Con Brosnan in a very difficult position, Brosnan accepted the arguments put forward by the likes of John Joe Sheehy that unless the players unanimously supported this boycott, it could cause a split not just within the team, but within the wider Kerry GA community. Now, Kerry were now joined by several other counties, 
uh, who refused to fulfill upcoming inter-county fixtures. Eventually, in July, the Free State Government authorised the release of all remaining Republican prisoners, including, of course, Eamon de Valera. And Austin Stack and his fellow Kerry prisoners returned to jubilant scenes in their own county. Now, the All Ireland was refixed for the 28th of September. On the date, however, Dublin proved just that little bit too strong, retaining their title by 1-5 to 1-3. Interestingly, it was reported that the Kerry team was flummoxed by the new short hand-passing game Dublin had perfected. And in fact, uh, newspaper reports say that throughout the game, there was groans of play Gaelic football Dublin coming ringing out from the vast Kerry crowd all throughout the match to little avail. But within six months, these two opponents were back to contest the 1924 All-Ireland. And in the week leading up to the game, uh, Dr. Eamon O'Sullivan, a psychiatric expert who would become the legendary trainer of eight All-Ireland Kerry winning teams over the next 40 years, he was brought in to supervise their training for the first time. Now at this stage, one of Kerry's best players was a man called Mundy Prendival, but he was studying as a clerical student in Manute College and was banned by the college authorities from playing in the final because he was shortly to be ordained as a priest. However, undeterred, he snuck out over the college wall very early on the morning of the match. Uh, he set out for Crow Park and made it in time to take his place on the starting 15. And a then record crowd of 30,000 traveled to see Kerry take on, <coughs> traveled to see if Kerry could take home their first All-Ireland in more than a decade. And after a very tense and strenuous struggle, the Kerry team emerged victorious on the scoreline of four points to three. Now that win kick-started a truly golden age of Kerry football. Over the next decade, that Kerry side won 10 Munster titles and six All-Irelands, including Kerry's first four in a row between 1929 and 1932. With the inauguration of the new National League competition, Kerry would win their first title in 1928 and would go on to claim the next four league titles played. Indeed, in league and championship, Kerry remained unbeaten in 34 competitive games between October of 1928 and March of 1933, and that record held until 2017. And only for the fact that there was no league actually played in 1930 and 31, uh, Kerry's run of victories could have been far greater. And Kerry's, this Kerry team's dominance of the inter-county scene was also reflected in the fact that an all-Kerry 15 captured two of the newly established Railway Cup competitions in both 1927 and again in 1931. And their international appeal, I suppose, was reflected in their decision to conduct three high-profile tours of the United States in 27, 31, and again in 1933. And the great rivalry with Kildare's last All-Ireland winning team uh, at this time had such a national appeal that the four finals those counties contested each saw record-breaking crowds, including an attendance of over 44,000 for the 1929 decider. And that was the first time any sporting event in Ireland broke the 40,000 attendance mark. Indeed, Kerry could and probably should have been even more dominant at this stage. There was, of course, they were on course to comfortably retain their All-Ireland in 1925 when the infamous Cavan objection, as it was called, to the legality of Phil O'Sullivan's appearance for Kerry in the aftermath of Kerry's victory over Cavan in the semi-final set off this chain reaction of objections and counter-objections, which saw the All-Ireland being abandoned and Galway handed the title without even qualifying for the actual final. Now, as I said, to a watching nation, the unprecedented success of this politically divided team seems to have captured the imagination. Uh, they became this forceful demonstration of the power of a sport to transcend the social divisions left by tragic conflict and unite a society still reeling from the horrors of the Civil War. Many believed then, and still do today, that the success of that Kerry team was instrumental in breaking down the barriers of hate left by the war, and that in Kerry itself, the GA provided people with an opportunity to unite in a common purpose and a passion. Without that uniting force of Gaelic football and that Kerry team, many argue it was debatable whether the post-war bitterness would have been healed. At the very least, many maintain it would have lingered far longer than was actually the case. And there's certainly an awful lot of evidence out there for how the success of this Kerry team and the actions of key individuals within it were a source of inspiration. And of all the incredible characters, and there were some fascinating characters on that, on that side, I just want to highlight three of them. John Joe Sheehy, Khan Brosnan, and Joe Barrett. 
Now there's John Joe Sheehy. Uh, he was a diehard Irish Republican. Uh, he earned his debut for Kerry as an 18 year old in 1915. He then became active in the Irish Volunteers under the command of Austin Stack in Tralee and, during the, and was involved in the failed German arms landing at Fenet during the 1916 Rising. Now, during the War of Independence, he had risen to the rank of Deputy Commander of the Tralee IRA and he had actually planned and executed the famous assassination of Major John McKinnon, the local commander of the Auxiliaries, while he played a round of golf in the town's golf course in April of 1921. Now, during the Civil War, Sheehy orchestrated the IRA's defence of Tralee against the Free State uh, Army landing at Phoenix. He subsequently went on the run and was actually hiding out near Ballyseedy Woods on the morning of the massacre there. Uh, she was actually one of the first to arrive on the scene, and he subsequently helped hide Stephen Fuller from the Free State authorities who were looking for him in the aftermath. Now, Sheehy, as you can see there, would captain Kerry to the 19, from centre forward, uh, to the All-Ireland in 1926. And it does say a lot about the common bond of the Kerry jersey that Sheehy, knowing intimately the atrocities carried out on his IRA comrades in the name of the Free State, that he would share a dressing room with the likes of Con Brosnan. Uh, now, Brosnan himself was no less a remarkable figure. Uh, Kerry's towering midfielder, he had actually scored the winning kick in the 1924 final. Now, like Sheehy, Brosnan was a committed nationalist. Uh, and by 1919 was active in the local company of the IRA in his village of Mai Van. In January 1921, he commanded the operation which saw the local RIC district inspector, Tobias O'Sullivan, being gunned down on a street in Listowel in broad daylight. Now, Brosnan was subsequently arrested for his suspected involvement in the killing and deported to an internment camp in Britain where he remained until the end of the War of Independence. Now, he strongly supported the treaty and he enlisted in the new army the provisional government was creating under Michael Collins. However, he of course, like many, bitterly regretted the outbreak of the Civil War and how it tore apart the once strong unity of the Irish independence movement. Now, when Free State forces landed and secured Kerry, Brosnan was stationed in the town of Tarbert for the remainder of the conflict, so he had actually no involvement in any of the tortures or executions overseen by Paddy Daly's Dublin Guards unit based in Tralee. He ended the war with the rank of captain. Now, he remained a committed supporter of the Free State and stood for election, narrowly missing out for Come and the Gale, the Come and the Gale Party in 1932. But as Fergal Keane has shown in his wonderful book, Wounds, on his own remarkable family history during the Irish Revolutionary era of that time, Brosnan remained haunted by the events of those tragic and turbulent years and his own hand in some of them. He once confided to a friend, for example, that he prayed every day for the souls of Tobias O'Sullivan and the others he had killed. And his later life was often consumed by severe depression, and too often he tried to find solace at the bottom of a pint glass. But Brosnan, like Sheehy, would be revered as one of the greatest players Kerry ever produced. He had a towering presence, not just on the field, but also in the dressing room. And in that position, he actually did all in his power to reach out to the Republicans on the team. Very famously, in October of 1924, Kerry were due to play Clare in the Munster final. Now, at that time, Sheehy was still on the run from the authorities. It was actually Brosnan who arranged for Sheehy's safe passage to travel to Limerick for the final. And although Sheehy was not named on the starting team, Brosnan actually informed a select inner circle of players that Sheehy would, in fact, be lining out. Sheehy made his own way into Limerick and entered the ground disguised as a spectator. He then emerged from the crowd just before Troen in his jersey and boots and took his place at centre forward. And once the match was won, Sheehy, in a scene that I'm sure inspired the filmmakers of Escape to Victory, he was allowed basically disappear into the throng of spectators who converged on the pitch and was basically allowed to make good his escape from the city. And Brosnan, though he would remain very politically active throughout his life, would not tolerate any political discussions in the Kerry dressing room. And again, his former teammates remarked in later life that this helped keep the unity of that extraordinary team together. Now, Joe Barrett from Rock Street in Tralee, the famous Rock Street Club, Austin Stacks it is now, he was the imposing fullback on this great Kerry side. And Barrett was active. Uh, with the IRA in the Civil War and was actually captured while on the run and subsequently interned by the government until December 1923. He then made his debut, his formal debut for Kerry the following year. Now, a committed Republican, 
Barrett, nevertheless, understood perfectly the symbolic importance of Kerry football in this era. Having captained Kerry to victory in 1929, he was due to be given the captaincy again in 1931 after Rock Street won the county title. Instead, Barrett immediately handed or turned the captaincy over to Con Brosnan, his friend but ideological rival. Now, that was not a very popular gesture at the time. I mean, Tralee remained very much a hotbed of republicanism, and Barrett and the Rock Street Club came under intense pressure to reverse the decision, with many decrying the spectacle, I suppose, of Kerry being captained by some free stater. Uh, yet Brosnan showed huge courage to stick by his convictions, that this gesture was for the good of the team and for the county as a whole. And so Con Brosnan duly led Kerry to victory in 1931, and then a year later, Barrett got his second chance to do likewise. Now, given everything I've discussed about how the Civil War played out in Kerry, and given how seriously we Kerry people take our football, and particularly our traditions around football, the semantics and the symbolism of what Joe Barrett did cannot be overstated. This is one of the most powerful expressions of how Kerry football was used to bridge the bitter divide of the Civil War. So, you're probably thinking, here he is, leading us down the path here of the typical Hollywood feel-good story about how sport and the GA was instrumental in bringing Irish society together out of the trauma of the Civil War. But of course, the truth is far more nuanced and multifaceted and more interesting for all of that. There was, and still is, perhaps understandably, a lot of hyperbole and myth-building surrounding that Kerry side. But the reality is, the poisonous inheritance of the Civil War was far too raw, far too complex to ever be erased in Kerry or elsewhere by mere sporting triumph. Uh, now, Siobhan says, I'm currently trying to start a research project, which I hope will be one of the first to explore the ordinary, everyday legacy of the Irish Civil War in Irish society. And I guess what I'm trying to highlight is how, how much the violence and intimidation and harassment uh, brought up and elicited by that conflict remained a significant factor in Irish life for years afterwards. Uh, and I want to utilize the wonderful uh, new digitized resources from this era, such as the Bureau of Military History and Military Service Pension Records, to try and explore how families and communities subsequently coped with the death and debilitating injuries of loved ones uh, lost by that conflict. And I guess ultimately what I'm trying to illustrate is that dynamic between the well-known public silence but actually the private preoccupation with the Civil War's legacy in the decade or two afterwards. Now, as historians, we are increasingly conscious of how much the shadow of the Civil War marked countless lives and communities in the years ever after. In its aftermath, for example, hundreds of IRA men were forced to emigrate as they basically found the Free State a cold house which actively discriminated against their attempts to settle down into civilian life or find work or continue their education. Uh, in my own area of Kerry, um, you know, there, there's a lot of evidence in the years afterwards of the likes of mothers, wives, and girlfriends of dead or interned Republicans facing frequent harassment or worse at the hands of local Free State supporters. For example, in one notorious incident in South Kerry, General Paddy Daly and two fellow officers violently assaulted two daughters of a local Kenmare doctor. The young women were dragged from their beds, allegedly raped, then beaten and flogged before having axle grease poured on their hair. Now, given Daly's position, of course, this incident sent shockwaves through the government, but it was quickly buried as it wanted to avoid any unnecessary scandal. But of course, it's not as if Republicans had any monopoly on suffering caused by the Civil War. I want to highlight Private Joseph O'Brien of Dublin. He was actually the sole survivor of the Nottingham explosion, but he was horribly maimed in the incident, and he had to have both legs amputated. He was married with three young children, and indeed his military pensions archive file, as Dermot Ferreter has shown, detailed the long, frustrating struggle his wife endured to get the government he fought for to award him a proper army pension so he could at least afford a wheelchair for himself. Now the reason uh, I'm so fascinated by sports history and the history of the GA is because in a country like Ireland, a sport is this wonderful window into society at large and all its nuances and complexities and what makes it that it beat, you know? And for me, what's so enthralling about this Kerry team is how much it reflected the ongoing impact of the Civil War divide in society. Because behind all the success and symbolism and media praise, there were still deep divisions and distrust in that Kerry dressing room. 
uh, wearing a common jersey could never simply wipe away the world outside the playing pitch. Now, John Joe Purty Landers would become one of the stars of that Kerry side. He made his debut as a 20-year-old in 1927. Now, Landers was active in the IRA, and he vividly described the political differences between the various factions in the Kerry dressing room as what he called most uncomfortable. Indeed, Landers asserted that often the free state advocates on the team would come to the game already togged out to avoid having to share a dressing room with the others. And these fr frictions were readily apparent when Kerry organized its first tour of the US in May of 1927. The event was supposedly organized to raise funds to allow the Kerry County Board to purchase the Tralee Sports Field, turning it into the future Austin Stack Park. However, in reality, much of the tour was actually secretly orchestrated by the IRA command under Moss Toomey to raise desperately needed funds for its depleted forces. But the tour famously became beset with problems both on and off the field. The three matches Kerry played against the New York selection uh, in the Polo Baseball Grounds in New York attracted impressive crowds of over 30,000. But Kerry were well beaten in all of those games. Now, Patrick Foley, who was the Kerryman's correspondent on the tour, claimed that a combination of the intense heat and humidity of the American summer, along with the unpleasant, uh, along with the strangeness, as he called it, of American food, had a lot to answer for, for these defeats. And to illustrate this, he reported on the unpleasant experience, as he called it, of ordering potatoes in a restaurant in New York, only to be given a bowl of sweet potatoes. And as he said, I couldn't bear to eat them. Now, outside of New York, the matches Kerry played were actually very poorly attended. And to round everything off, days before the tour ended, the American promoter, who had been hired to oversee the entire enterprise, disappeared from the team hotel, taking with him all of Kerry's profits from the gate receipts. So not a success. But the tour is actually a fascinating example of how the IRA in this era playing on the close connections between the Kerry GA and the Republican movement were using the star power of the Kerry team for their own ends. It was intended that the match receipts from two of the New York games would be diverted into the IRA's coffers. And John Joe Sheehy acted as the link man between the IRA command and his own teammates. Now, while he knew that most of the team had Republican sympathies, he was worried about the possibility of players like Con Brosnan finding out about the hidden hand of the IRA. Indeed, despite the prevailing narrative of this Kerry team being brothers in arms across the political divide, Sheehy actually suggested to the IRA's leadership that Brosnan be sent threatening letters, warning him that his life would be in danger if he traveled to the US. Now, in the end, the fear that Brosnan would go public if he received any such letters persuaded Sheehy to drop the notion and tra Brosnan traveled with the team. Now, outside of the matches themselves, Sheehy and other Republicans on the Kerry team were frequently guests of honor at a range of dances, rallies, and social events intended to help IRA fundraising. And most remarkably of all, of all, of all in, 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 in all of this was that Sheehy and those players who could be trusted actually agreed to smuggle home in their luggage a cache of Thompson submachine guns, which were owned by the IRA and were held for safekeeping in New York at this time. And so Sheehy and a number of Kerry players packed them away on their boat returning home, and then they were secretly disrupt, or distributed to active IRA units across Ireland once they landed. Now, all the while this is going on, I suppose the dominance of the Kerry team at home showed no signs of ending. However, Kerry's brilliance was not universally lauded. In 1930, they met Monaghan in that county's only ever All-Ireland appearance. Now, Man Monaghan actually rushed out of the blocks. They managed to score one of the quickest points ever in All-Ireland history, and this gave huge hope to their supporters. But really, that's as good as it got. Things quickly fell apart, and they were routed on a scoreline of a three goals and 11 points to only two points. Despite this comfortable victory, however, the match would enter GA folklore on the time as the last battle of the Civil War. And this was not just due to the, noted, the known Republican element on the Kerry team and the fact their opponents contained several officers in both the Guards and the Free State Army, but also because of the number of Monaghan players injured in the match and the subsequent accusations of the rough tactics used by Kerry. After the game, for example, the Monaghan County Board protested against what they called the brutality of Kerry's play. 
and the supposed bias of the referee. And at a meeting of the Central Council that December, the Monaghan GA formally objected to the result, claiming the match resembled, and I quote, a Spanish bullfight. Now, the meeting concluded that the Monaghan protests were, and I quote, a most childish expedition, exhibition of humbug. However, a reputation for Kerry Vigor uh, seems to have persisted. Following their 1932 All-Ireland uh, victory over Mayo, the Kerry County Board complained that the match referee, Martin O'Neill, had actually entered the Kerry dressing room before the throw-in and, as they described, insulted the Kerry players, stating that as far as he was concerned, they had been blackguarding in every game they played, and I will stop the match if you carry on like that today. But by now, much of Ireland was in the grip of what the historian Joe Lee called the last spasm of the Civil War, as a revitalised IRA came increasingly into conflict with the blue shirt movement emerging under Owen O'Duffy. And in areas like North Kerry, tensions between both groups, fueled of course by the recent memories of the Civil War, played out in a wave of shootings, arson, attacks, intimidation and violence. And it brought the inherent tensions within the Kerry GA to boiling point at this time, so much so that the Listowel GA actually split in two um, over its members' political differences, with two rival teams, the Ashes and the Pierces, emerging at this stage. Across North Kerry, certain clubs became identified with either one side or the other, so much so that one local championship match was abandoned after a full-scale riot broke out uh, among sp supporters amid shouts and goads of up the blue shirts. And so, because of all this, the chasm left by the Civil War resurfaced, and the Kerry team itself threatened to be torn apart by their ideological divisions. Uh, Johnny Walsh, as you see there, of Bally Longford, became the team's latest star uh, in the early 30s, but he vividly recalled the rising tensions within the Kerry dressing room, given the way many players were associated with either the Blue Shirts or the IRA at this stage. Uh, now, coming himself from a staunch Cum and the Gale family, Walsh's status as a Kerry player did little to protect him. For example, in Eastern 1933, he was involved in an altercation with members of the local IRA who had tried to vandalise his parents' pub, after which he was branded as a Blue Shirt. And that reputation followed him all the way across the Atlantic later that year when he lined out for Kerry against New York in the first match of Kerry's 1933 American tour. Now, Walsh describes being singled out by the opposition for particular rough treatment, and he said that Tom Armitage, the New York captain, came up to him yelling, you blue shirt, I'm going to send you back to Cosgrave in a coffin. Now, Walsh said he replied, listen, you've an hour to do that, so. And when the first ball was thrown in between both, Walsh, who was a noted amateur boxer, gave Armitage apparently such a dig in the ribs that Armitage had to be stretchered off the pitch. But Walsh felt that his political beliefs were the reason he was passed over for selection for the Kerry team in 1934. And very much disillusioned, he turned to playing rugby before eventually coming back to reclaim his place on the Kerry team in time for 1936. Now, by now, Kerry's star had begun to wane. Uh, the end was, was sudden and unexpected because in the aftermath of their 1932 All-Ireland, there was actually grave concerns that Kerry's dominance would destroy the inter-county uh, game itself. The Daily Express, for example, noted that, and I quote, the same old problem remains. The superiority of Kerry is now a very serious problem for Gaelic administrators. Uh, the GIA, however, seemed unperturbed. Its president, Sean Ryan, labelled Kerry in the aftermath of their latest successful tour of the US the champions of the world. Yet, that team finally met their Waterloo on the 27th of August, 1933, when Cavan defeated them by a goal in the All-Ireland semi-final played in Breffney Park. And it was their first championship defeat since July, 1928. And it was so significant that the Anglo-Celt headline screamed that this was, and I quote, an event of international importance. And Kerry actually very nearly escaped too. A last desperate attack just before the referee blew the whistle, saw Bill Landers inexplicably kick inches wide as he found himself in front of an open goal. But as the Bard said, all good things must come to an end. And it would take four years rebuilding before a new Kerry side emerged to bring Sam Maguire back to the kingdom in 1937. Uh, so that's it. That's the end of what I believe is not just the most remarkable Kerry team ever to take the field, 
but the most remarkable team in GA, if not all of Irish sports history. A team that came to symbolize the role the GA could play in healing the divisions of the Civil War, but one that was all the more fascinating for the insight they gave us about the complex legacy of that conflict on Irish society and how much that manifested itself on and off the playing field. Um, so it's an honor to be here today in my, to help in my own little way uh, push forward the great work the GA is doing to commemorate Bloody Sunday. And that follows on really from their excellent work in uh, honoring the 1916th centenary. And for the maturity, in fairness, I thought the GA showed in late 2018 uh, for recognizing the role of GA players who fought and died in the First World War. And I was also delighted to help contribute to both of those occasions. But undoubtedly, the most difficult commemoration for our society is yet to come. How we honestly and respectfully recall, confront, and as a nation, interpret the unpleasant reality of the Civil War and what it represented. Because that conflict and its inheritance is just as much a part of our history as 1916. And it is just as important in understanding the subsequent history of this country. Now, early last year, I tried to start a conversation in Kerry with the County Council and the general public about how Kerry needed to take ownership of the official state commemoration of the Civil War, given Kerry's prominence in the struggle and the harrowing events like Bally City that happened there. And for me, commemoration, of course, we had an awful lot of debate about commemorations at the start of this year. For me, they're not about cherry picking the best or the easiest events or those that supposedly make us feel good. It's about being truthful. It's about being respectful to the past and all its nuances and complexities and all those shades of gray I keep telling my students about. That is what history is made up of. And I'll continue to argue and campaign for Kerry to host a state commemoration at Bally CD to do justice to that conflict and its importance. In the same way the official events in Dublin in 2016 marked the rising and the events in Cork this autumn will recognize the War of Independence. But I just want to end today by making another pitch to the GA here. If it wants to commemorate the significant role of the association and, it play, and how it played out that role in the aftermath of the Civil War, if it wants to highlight how much Gaelic games survived those dark times and played their significant part in bringing our society together after years of bitter struggle, and if it wants to show how much sport, politics and legacy and the legacy of that conflict are so intertwined in the new Irish state, then surely there would be no better way of doing that than by honouring this remarkable Kerry team. Uh, what a great subject for a documentary they would make. Hopefully you will admit that theirs is one hell of a story. Thank you very much.